Our first reading from the Lord's Word is from the Gospel of Mark in chapter 9. This is the story of the Lord healing the boy with a mute spirit. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them, and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son, who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Amen. Now we will read further in the word of the Lord in his heavenly doctrine in the work Apocalypse Explained. And this passage is describing why the disciples could not heal the boy with the mute spirit. The Lord called disciples men of little faith when they were unable to do miracles in his name because of their unbelief. And this for the reason that while the disciples believed the Lord to be the Messiah, or Christ, also the Son of God, and the prophet of whom it was written in the Word, yet they did not believe that he was God Almighty, and that Jehovah the Father was in him. And yet so far as they believed him to be a man, and not at the same time God, his divine, to which omnipotence belongs, could not be present with the disciples by faith. For faith presents the Lord as present, as has been said above, but faith in him as a man, as a man only, does not present his divine omnipotence as present. And then lastly, we read in the Arcana Celestia, or Heavenly Secrets, uh, a passage regarding the nature of prayer. Prayer, regarded in itself, is speech with God, in some internal view at the time of the matters of the prayer, to which there answers something like an influx into the perception or thought of the mind, so that there is a certain opening of the person's interiors towards God, but this with a difference according to the person's state and according to the essence of the subject of the prayer. If the person prays from love and faith, 
and for only heavenly and spiritual things, there then comes forth in the prayer something like a revelation, which is manifested in the affection of him that prays, as to hope, consolation, or a certain inward joy. Amen. Why is it that there are some things in our lives that we just can't seem to overcome? Why is it that we continue to struggle with evil inclinations when all we want is for the hells to stop attacking us? For example, we might tell ourselves over and over again, all right, I'm not going to think ill of that person anymore, or I'm not going to visit that website anymore, or even I'm not going to use foul language anymore. Sometimes we try to commit to repentance, and yet we find ourselves repeating our old habits. Why is that? What are we doing wrong? Today we're going to talk about why it can sometimes be difficult to make these changes in our life, and we'll also talk about what we can do to actually make those changes that we want. But now I invite you to imagine yourself as a spectator from, from the story in Mark. There's a multitude of people with the Lord's disciples standing there, uh, watching a helpless boy with a mute spirit, and they're unable to offer him relief. The boy is being violently thrown to the ground, convulsing, foaming at the mouth, gnashing his teeth, and then he becomes rigid, stiff, and lifeless. Imagine the feelings of hopelessness amongst the crowd after watching that. They surely wanted something to happen, but nothing was happening. And this must have been very disheartening and discouraging for everyone there. And we would probably feel the same way if we witnessed such a traumatic spectacle. And to make matters even worse, the scribes were there, arguing and disputing with the crowd and the disciples in particular. In a few chapters before this story, the disciples were given authority over unclean spirits. They were given the power by the Lord to heal. But here, they were completely useless. The scribes probably saw this inadequacy as a perfect opportunity to discredit their power, and even more so, the Lord's power. Whatever they were saying served only to fan the flames of panic and fear with everyone present. So again, just, just imagine the whole scene. There is the multitude of people surrounding uh, a poor boy, unable to offer him help, and the scribes are yelling at the crowd and the disciples, stirring up all sorts of trouble. It's a pretty bleak scene. When we consider the spiritual meaning of the story, we see that all of these characters are aspects of our own life, of our own minds. We have the multitude, the disciples, the scribes, the boy, and even the mute spirit all living inside of us, interacting with each other. Now the multitudes or the crowds, spiritually speaking, are the thoughts in our mind that, that react to various issues and anxieties in our life. Perhaps they can detect trouble, but they don't necessarily know how to move us forward. They tell us, I want to change, or I need to change and, and stop this bad habit, but I don't know how. This way of thinking can easily be swayed by truth or by falsity. When they're prompted by the truth, they tell us, yes, I can overcome this. The Lord can help me beat this evil. But when they're prompted by falsity, they tell us, there is no way I can ever change. I've always been like this. It's a useless endeavor to even try. 
And we can see this in the story. Notice the way that the multitude reacts when the Lord is present and when he is not present. When the Lord isn't present, they're most likely panicking and afraid. But when the Lord was present, there was a sense of hope and relief in his presence. Now the scribes, the scribes are what the writings call the falsification of truth. We falsify the truth when we believe that the Lord's word is true and yet find a myriad of ways to discredit it and dismiss it. Perhaps we believe and understand these truths intellectually, yet we continue to indulge and entertain the evil that flows in. When we think in these ways, we might make excuses as to why we don't need to change our old ways. Or perhaps they discourage us and make us believe that there is no way that we can change. But the real issue with these thoughts is that they trick us into believing that falsity is truth and truth is falsity. This completely blocks our ability to see what is really true and what is really healing. And we can see in the story that the scribes were acting in the same way. All they did was get in the way of, of helping this poor boy. And then we have the disciples. The disciples represent the truths that we put into practice in our life. They represent those times when we are following the Lord and are doing what he wants for us. But in this story, they displayed weakness. In this story, they represent the truths that we know, but lack faith in their real power. It's not a dismissal of the truth. It's simply that we don't know how to apply those truths to our life or to our certain situations. The disciples, similarly, had power from the Lord to heal, they just didn't believe in it. Now remember how these three characters are in interacting with one another in the story. We have the scribes or, or the falsified truths that are arguing with the disciples or our good states, and they're also, the scribes are also arguing with the multitude or those thoughts that, that can be swayed towards what is true or what is false. Now, imagine how, how they might interact in our own minds. The endless and loud barrage of, I can't change, or it's too late for me to change, completely discourages and stifles the truth that we can. The scribes of our mind might tell us that there is no point in even trying. And if we give these false ideas enough credence and enough power, we may end up convinced that they are true. Now, the sun and the mute spirit are also part of our life. The sun represents our external life, or the conscious part of us that we're living in right now. He is that very part of us, uh, our very part of our life when we're spiritually stuck. And the muteness of the Spirit symbolizes our failure to, con uh, to confess our genuine faith in the Lord. In other words, this muteness is our spiritual state when we don't believe in the Lord's saving power. And then there's the deafness of the Spirit. The deafness of the Spirit represents our inability to hear and acknowledge what is true. This spiritual deafness obscures our ability to hear what the Lord says, and when we can't understand what he says, or don't know that his, what he says is truly healing, we don't see the need for the truth. This deafness is much like the boy's deafness. 
From all of this, it is easy to see how there are a lot of forces and a lot of factors at work working hard to ensure that we don't become the heavenly people we wish to become. But however bleak our situation may seem, there is a way out of this. So what is it? How can we be healed just as the boy was healed? There is one character who did believe in the Lord's healing power, and it was the boy's father. It is the faith that the father has in the Lord's healing that really saves his son. So recall the father desperately pleading with the Lord for the salvation of his son. He was introduced early in the story as one of the crowd. Remember that although the crowd may easily be swayed by false ways of thinking and perspective, uh, perspectives, it's not always the case. The crowd can also be influenced by the Lord, and this was the case with the Father. The Father represents the love and genuine desire that we have from the Lord. This genuine desire does prompt us to be a better person, by imploring the Lord's help. So when the forces of evil are at work in our mind, remember that the Lord has still implanted in us the ability to respond to him in all states. It's merely a matter of seeking the Father out of the crowd and bringing him to the Lord for guidance. And sometimes this is difficult. When we find ourselves in a bad place, we might think that our problem is too difficult for the Lord to handle. Sometimes we might lose sight of who God really is. We forget that he is the omnipotent God of heaven and earth. We forget that he alone is the one who actually can save us. He can actually save us from hell and raise us up into heaven. So if we carry around with us the idea that God isn't powerful enough to change us, he won't be able to. Remember our lesson from the Apocalypse Explained. It said that the reason the disciples couldn't heal the boy was because they did not believe in the Lord's omnipotence. When our idea of God is such that we do not believe in his all-powerfulness or his omnipotence, we might think that imploring the help of the Lord is a useless gesture. How many of us have said, I've always been this way. Who's to say I can change now? In the story, it too was difficult for the father to believe, but he gave it a shot. He said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And after that, the Lord heals the boy. So the boy has now been healed, and the mute spirit is gone. A little while later in the story, the disciples ask the Lord, why could we not cast it out? The Lord's response is simple, yet profound. He said that this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. So what does this mean? Prayer, as we discovered in our lessons, is talking to God or speech with God. It involves having an honest and earnest conversation with him. But it's also a two-way street Prayer is about talking to the Lord, but it's also about listening to his response. The passage speaks of the importance of our prayers coming from a place of love and faith. The love, as we have said, is this genuine desire to, to change the Father in the story, and faith is the trust that the Lord can bring about that change. So in our prayers, it may be useful to discuss what the specific issue is and why it keeps on happening. 
Perhaps we can talk to the Lord about the different ways of avoiding those situations that prompt us to lapse into our old habits. When our prayers are such, there is something of a revelation and hope. Perhaps it's as small as, I want this to change, and I know that trusting in the Lord's power will get me through it. While we're praying, it's also important to keep in mind who we are praying to. In other words, we have to believe in the Lord's divine omnipotence, which is the real power that he has to help us overcome our evils. If we pray without believing that he can change us, he can't do anything to help us. And lastly, there's this element of fasting. Fasting is about mourning and feeling sadness. Fasting is about the difficulty that we experience when we deprive ourselves of our evil. After we've said our prayers, hoping and trusting in the Lord's power, there is a call to action. And when it comes to this action, or in this case, giving up our evil loves, it can feel sad. Remember, the reason that we do anything at all, whether it is good or evil, is because we believe we'll gain something from it. Sometimes we believe that we'll get something out of thinking ill, clicking on that website link, or even cursing. And it's not true. Still, giving up those things can be challenging. Recall in the story how the boy was as if dead after the spirit went out of him. And think of what it, what it feels like for us to give up some of our old habits. Giving up those evil things that we love can feel as if we are dying. Not only does this feeling remind us of how much we loved our old habits and ways, it's more so, it is more so a sign of how much we need to rely on the Lord for strength and power in overcoming them. So when we look to the Lord with the hope and the trust that he can change us, he raises us up just like he did with the boy. So when our mind is plagued by the multitude of discouraging thoughts that tell us that changing is a useless endeavor, remember the faith that the Father had in the Lord. And remember that the Lord is all-powerful and can heal us, too. It's simply a matter of believing that he has that power. In carrying that confidence in our life of repentance will ensure the Lord's victory in our lives. For if you will believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Amen.